together with me as we read together some of the scripture. Hallelujah. Bless the name of God. How many of you love the word of God? Hallelujah. Praise his name. Scripture says this. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up according to the custom. Or as they were used to doing time and time again. According to the custom of the feast. And when the feast had ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, and his parents did not knowing know it, but supposing him to be in the group, and I want you to call your attention to that, supposing him to have been in the group, in the company, with them, they went an entire day's journey when they suddenly realized somebody's missing. Somebody's not here. Hmm. And when they did not find him, they, they went among their relatives, their friends began to ask and, and search. And when they didn't find him, they decided, well, I guess we've got to go back. We've got to go back because he's not here. We have left him behind, and we've got to go back. God bless you this morning. Father, we thank you and praise you for the privilege, the opportunity we have to come together, surrounded by your presence here in this place, Lord God, Around your word, thank you, God, this morning for your word. Speak to us, Spirit of God. Move in our midst. Do what you will in this place. We give you free reign. All honor and glory belongs to you, and we ask you, Jesus, hide us behind the cross. May you be seen, glorified, lifted high in this place this morning. Every heart in life would be drawn to you. For your glory, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Imagine, they're celebrating the feast that they had done so many times before. They were used to celebrating. They went up like they did every year according to the custom, the Bible says, what they were used to. And they assumed it would be just like every other year. Go through the motions of the worship and the sacrifice and all of the rest. But it wasn't like every other year. God had something particular in mind. This is a prophetic passage of Scripture. If you don't know it, I'm going to tell you this morning. This is a prophetic passage of Scripture. They go an entire day's journey, and they realize, wait a minute, somebody's not here. Imagine, an entire day's journey, and they, they suddenly realize, where, where's Jesus? And they go among their relatives, their friends, the caravan who went with them, and they're saying, do you know where he is? Is he with you? Have you seen him? And he is nowhere to be found in their company. Imagine that. Imagine traveling all that way, 24 hours, an entire day they go, and they realize he's not here. And after some time, after inquiring about all, all of their friends and relatives and all in the company, they didn't find him. They decided, we better go back. We've got to go back. Where was the last place that we saw him? Where was he? When we knew that he was with us, where was it? It was in the house of the Father. We've got to go back. And so they went back an entire, another two days journey, the Bible says, 
So they found him on the third day. Hmm. Wow. Imagine that. Imagine that. They found him on the third day. They realized, man, he's not here. He's not with us. They had their own mindset. I imagine they had their schedule, you know, their idea of, of what was going to happen, what they had to get home to that was so pressing, they had to leave punctually, you know, in order so that they could continue their routines and get back to what they had to do. But God was not in it. Imagine having your plans and your purposes, your programs. Imagine setting up your agenda and be surprised that God is not in it. Mm. Wow. Do you know this is a picture of the church today? Many have gone off following their agenda. Many build ministries, works by their own name, establishing things not even realize that he isn't even in it. Whether we like it or not, we are part of the Laodicean <laughs> church. In the book of Revelation, you know there are a series of messages to churches there. And it's a progression, really, from the church in Ephesus, which was a picture of the early church, the church of the disciples, you know, up until the last day, the last day. And if, if you don't know what time it is, let me tell you what time it is. We are in the last of the last day. All things are about to be fulfilled. The culmination of all things is at hand. Time is very quickly, as we know it, coming to an end. The day is far spent. The scripture tells us nighttime quickly approaches the time in which works are over and done with. And then there's a reckoning. God says that generation, this last generation is a generation that can't make up its mind. They are like the nation of Israel in days of old. They, they don't know whether they want to serve him with all of their heart or whether they want to follow after the things of the world. They are caught in a tug of war between the two. Well, we want the blessings and benefits of the kingdom of God. We want healing. We want prosperity. Everybody wants prosperity, right? Hello. We want to be blessed. Everybody wants the blessed. That's a big thing in, when you're working with the Brazilians. You know, the, everybody talks about the blessing, the blessing, the blessing. Well, who doesn't want the blessing? Everybody wants the good life. but they don't want to have to go through what you got to go through in order to obtain from God. They don't want to have to face affliction or trouble or hardship, although the word says if you're going to come into the kingdom, you must through many tribulations enter. And if you don't know it yet, 
Some of us do know it. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. So if you're going to be righteous, get ready. But I'm glad he didn't stop the verse there. Because I can say, oh yes, amen. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. And I have gone through many of those tribulations. But I can also say, with a surety, knowing in my spirit, the last part of that passage, the Lord delivers him out of them all. Hallelujah. 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 There is a morning to every night. There is a time of breakthrough, thank God. <laughs> a time when the trial ends and the morning breaks. Hallelujah. But God says this last generation they want the best that the world has to offer. They want to be in love with stuff and things, with the world, the best that the world has, and yet they want the fullness and blessing of God too. But the two don't mix. Like oil and water. They are far separate. There's no gray, gray area in God, you know. In the church, we think <laughs> that there's a lot of gray area, but there isn't. And God told the children of Israel, look, choose you this day whom you're going to serve. If you want to serve Baal, go ahead and serve him. Follow after the way of the world. Give your all. Grab the gusto. Go for it. But if you want to serve me, then serve me. Serve me. As they're celebrating the feast, I, I remember in my mind's eye, in Passover there are four distinct cups in the celebration of the feast. And they are pictured in the table of the Lord, which we celebrate. And they are really a picture of our salvation. And sometimes I think we need to be reminded of what it's really all about. What's the real plan and purpose in all of it? They are celebrating the feast the feast that recounts the time when they are delivered out of the hand of their enemy, out of their bondage, out of their slavery. God, by his own hand, delivers them, ransoms them, rescues them. After having been enslaved and in bondage for 400 years, God raises up a man who hears his voice and tells the people what God says. And if they are obedient to everything that he speaks, and if they will do everything that he says, God delivers them, rescues them out of the land of their bondage, out of their slavery. But the four cups are a picture of that. And the first cup is the cup of sanctification. That's a very strange word to the church today. But see, God's plan and purpose was not with Egypt. It wasn't with the world. He said, listen, if you're going to be what I would have you to be, you need to come out from among them. My plan and purpose is not with Egypt. You need to come out. Come out. Come out of Egypt out of your bondage, out of your slavery. I'm calling you to come out. Come out and come in. Come into what? Not a piece of property that I'm going to give you in the middle of the desert. No. Come into relationship with me. I want you to know me. I want you to serve me. I want you to follow after me. 
That was God's purpose and intent. But they could never find fulfillment in the promise until they came out of what enslaved them. They had to be set free from their bondage, from their slavery. They had to separate themselves. That's a message that isn't heard today in the church. We think that coming to Christ is just repeat these words. Say this. Hocus, and we wave our magic wand and hocus pocus, you're in. No. <clears throat> Sanctification. Sanctification. If you come out, I'll meet you. They had to take the lamb. Sacrifice mm. the lamb. Take the blood of the sacrifice. Put it upon the doorposts of their dwelling places, upon the lintels and the doorposts of their dwelling places as they take the hyssop, anointing the door. Imagine. With the blood of the sacrifice. I had to be obedient to every word that God said. Because at midnight, the angel of death was visiting the camp. You see, Pharaoh had hardened his heart. And through a whole series of unfortunate events, <laughs> coming against every idol and demonic force in Egypt and overthrowing every idol and false God, God defeats all of them and brings judgment and proves that he is God above all. There's one more test. And this is going to break the camel's back or Pharaoh's back. Literally, it will later on. <laughs> but Pharaoh finally because at midnight, whoever didn't have the blood of the sacrifice on their homes, the angel of death came and visited every home from Pharaoh's all the way to the least. Every home that did not have the sacrifice, the blood of the sacrifice on the dwelling, the angel of death visited that home and every firstborn son died. Even the cattle even the livestock, even the family pets, all of them. And a great cry went up from the land of Egypt. Well, I guess God really means business. Yes, he does. What he says is, and it will always be as he says it is. He doesn't mix words. He speaks the truth. And you must walk in it and abide by it, whether you like it or whether you don't. His word is eternal, everlasting to everlasting. How long is everlasting? <laughs> He's God, sovereign Lord. He reigns supreme. Doesn't have to answer to Congress or Parliament doesn't need your approval or mine. He's God all by himself. Amen. Hallelujah. It's not a democracy, the kingdom of heaven. I hate to tell you. <laughs> and we really don't live in a democracy either. We think we do, but we live in a republic. It's a representative. Well, let me, we're not going there. <laughs> We got a lot of misconceptions that we got to kind of change our mindset about. You know what that really means in the literal change your mind? Do you know that's the root of the word repentance? Change. That's where it all begins. And this is what this is a picture of. You got to start thinking differently. Got to start walking differently. Got to start 
acting differently because the kingdom of heaven is direct, in direct opposition to what you're used to, living in the flesh by the world system. Completely opposite from what you think and what you believe and where you are going. God is wanting to change your mind. He wants you to think on things that are above. He wants you to set your direction in a new direction, following after him, his heart, his word, so that you really would know and experience the fullness of life as he would have it to be lived. So they had to come out. And he showed them redemption's plan. When they took the lamb and they had to eat every part of it. They couldn't leave any part behind. They had to eat it all. The whole counsel of God. Couldn't pick and choose which part they liked which part they didn't like. It wasn't up for a vote. Kids couldn't say, well, I don't want that. Every part, every bit, eat it all. Jesus said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my, my blood, you have no part in me. You must take the whole counsel of God. You know, he told the prophet, eat the scroll. Eat it all. Eat it all. However unpleasant it may seem to you, eat it all. It will be to your benefit. It will bless you. It will produce in you. But you must eat it all. Every word. We used to sing a song, remember, every promise in the book is, well, not every promise is mine. Thank God. I don't claim those scriptures about hell. <laughs> there are promises in there to the ungodly. to the disobedient. I don't want to be found in that group. To the carnal. He speaks to them. Promises to the Laodicean church, which I don't want to belong to, by the way. Hallelujah. And I don't have to. <laughs> because there are still Philadelphians around who haven't yet bowed their knee and given themselves who are still faithful and hold on to the promise of God and believe God and love his word. And they are faithful. And to them, God has given an open door. I remember God spoke that passage of scripture to our hearts when God called us onto the field. I have placed before you an open door that no man can close. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. The promises of God are yea and amen in Christ. That is if you are in Christ. In Christ. Hallelujah. We must evaluate ourselves to see really if we belong to God. Let him count the cost. Before you get ready to build, you better count the cost. There's a price to be paid. He paid for you and I with his own blood. Jesus was the Passover. He is the Passover lamb. Hallelujah. 
what they did was a picture of the atoning work of Jesus on that cross. He gave himself for you and for me. And it was personal for them. You must take the lamb for yourself and eat it for yourself. Every part of it. Apply the blood of the sacrifice to your dwelling place. It was personal. You must do this. Every household. Salvation also is personal. You must recognize that he died for you. He died for me. He shed his blood. If we were the only ones, if I was the only one on earth, he would have come and died for me. When he died on that cross, it was my sin that he took upon himself. It was for me that he died. And when he died, I also died. I'm in Christ. Scripture says, nevertheless I live, yet not. Not I, but Christ liveth in me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith. In the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's no longer I who lives. I don't belong to myself. We were bought with a price. The precious blood of Jesus ransomed me. I'm not my own. I belong to him. He belongs to me. The ransom has been paid in full. And then there's the cup of deliverance. God was delivering them by his own outstretched hand. Deliverance from bondage, from slavery, from the hand of the enemy, hand in reach of the enemy. As they go through the sea, God miraculously opens before them. Imagine what it must have been like to be there. And you're escaping out of Egypt. And the sea is before you. As far as you can see, it seems in the natural there's a block. <laughs> There's a dead end. There's a brick wall. How in the world are we ever? There's no boat. <laughs> There's no raft. I can't swim that far. <laughs> and here comes Pharaoh and his army in hot pursuit. Oh, God, did you bring us out here to let us die by the hand of our enemy in this? God-forsaken desert. Stand still and see the salvation of God. God himself. Moses, what is that that you've got in your hand? <laughs> Just lift up your hand. Lift up your hand and see. And God makes the sea to part before them so that they walk through on dry ground. Can you imagine? Walking through the midst of this. Now, I have to say, if I saw something like that happen and I was chasing, I don't think I'd still be chasing after them. I think I would have left my pursuit you won. <laughs> I'll see you later. <laughs> I'm not going to run after you. But his heart was hardened. <laughs> and God made an example of him, and he wanted to prove to them if they hadn't 
had enough already. Evidence that he was God. As they ate that lamb healing in their bodies, they were enslaved for 400 years. Hurting in bondage, as hurting as I am some days with these bones in the weather, this new wonderful New England weather that we have, and the dampness and all of the rest. Can you imagine being beaten every day, worked to death every day? Can't even begin to imagine what they had to go through on a daily basis. And yet, when they came out, there was not one sick or feeble among them, as they ate that lamb, something happened supernaturally inside of them that transformed their bodies. And they had a new, st- a new walk, a new step, a new spring in their step. God himself had quickened their natural bodies as they ate that sacrificial lamb. He healed their bodies, and so they went through. In his power, his anointing, whole, not one feeble or sick among them, God delivers them, and they stand on the other side and see their enemies swallowed up by the sea. God delivers them from the hand of their oppressor, from their slavery, from their sin, from their bondage, from the hand of the enemy. God brings deliverance. They see the salvation of God and know the plan and purpose of God. And yet, as they go to that mountain, to the very place where Moses had received revelation, and God gets ready to come down on the mountain, he speaks to them and tells them, you got to get ready. Prepare yourself because in two days, there's that two days again. In two days, I'm coming down on the mountain in the sight of all the people. So you got to be ready. Change your direction, Joseph and Mary. God is about to do something. I know you've got your agenda. I know you've got your mindset. I know you have your programs. But you got to go back. Back to the plan and purpose of God. Back to the word of God. It's not about you. It's all about him. We used to sing a song some time ago. Sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. It's all about you, Jesus. It's all about you, Jesus. It's not about me. It's not about mine. No flesh, the Bible says, will glory in the presence of God. Many have making a name for themselves. And we think we do wonderful things, but if we do them apart from the presence and the anointing of God, God only accepts and gives credence to and blesses what comes from him. Whatever is not of faith, the scripture says, is sin. There's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is death. I don't care who's doing it. I don't care who gives credence to it or who says everybody should do it. If it didn't come from him, why are you doing it? Why do you give credence to something that isn't wrought by the word of Almighty God? Why do you give yourself to things that are temporal, that will pass away? Why do we give ourselves and fill our lives with things that have no eternal value? We chase after things and long for things and fill our lives with things 
that in the long run don't amount to any benefit. A work of the flesh. And yet there's a lot of flesh today in the body of Christ. I'm reminded of that third chapter in the book of Revelation. And I'm always amazed at this. This is a picture of our day and of our time. And where is Jesus in, Gen in Revelation 3.15? Outside of the church. Wait a minute. Outside. Knocking at the door. Let me in. How in the world did he get out there? I thought it was supposed to be about him. We've left him. Somewhere along the line, we left the plan and purpose of God, chasing after something else. Because somebody said, oh, there's something new, Pastor Mark. There's a new revelation. There's a new revelation. Something new, you got to try it. A lot of things blowing in the wind. But they don't come from God. This is eternal. This is eternal. Set your heart and minds on things that are above. That which is eternal. Give yourself to this word. This is the living water. Born again by incorruptible seed. Every word given by the breath of God. This is what we give ourselves to. This is the plumb line. This is the standard. This is what we line ourselves up with. This is what we give our allegiance to. Anything else? There's darkness and there's light. And God says of this generation... See, they don't know what is profane and what's holy. In the book of Malachi, he says to them, you know your offerings disgust me. I'm putting it in my modern-day vernacular. <clears throat> Paraphrasing. But it means just that. I have a problem with you, priests. I've got a problem with you, church. I've got a problem with you and your offerings because you take the best for yourself. You build kingdoms for yourself and then you offer me all the lame, the halt, the blind, what you can't even sell on the side. That's what you give to me. That's the day we find ourselves. And God says you can't even tell the difference anymore between what's holy and what's profane. You don't know what's, what's wicked and what's good. Whatever man deems right in his own eyes, that's your standard. Whatever wind seems to be blowing at the time. And we're like, really, like, sometimes dumb sheep, willing to follow anyone or anything. Ooh, it's good, it's new, it's exciting, it's... <laughs> but my sheep, Jesus said, they hear my voice. And they know me. They don't listen to anybody else. They won't adhere to another's voice. They've learned to discern when it comes from me. 
There are those who have not yet bowed their knee. But you know the greatest inheritance that we have from God is not what comes by way of the world or what you can receive by the way of the world because the greatest inheritance that we receive from him is him. He gives us himself. When God called them to the mountain, he said, come up here. I want to show you something, Moses. I want to reveal myself to you because this is your inheritance. It's me. I am that I am. I'm yours. You're mine. And I want you to know me. I want you to know me intimately. Walk in communion with me. Jesus knocking at the door. What does he say? Let me in. Let me in. Who has ears? Does anybody hear? Does anybody have ears to hear the knocking on the door? If you let me in, Jesus said, I'll fellowship with you. I'll commune with you. Right after he gives those words to the churches, the very thing, next thing he says in Revelation 4, verse 1, come up here. Come up here. I'm calling you to a higher place, a greater place in me. Get away from your ideas, your mindset. Change your mind. Start thinking with a new mindset. I'm calling you to myself. Joseph and Mary, you got to go back. You've left him. You had your ideas, your agenda, your mindset. But your mindset and God's were two different, entirely, th entirely different things. Got to go back. He's waiting in the house of the Father with arms open wide, calling. Come up here. Come up here. There are things that I need to share with you. There are things I need to reveal with you, to you, with you, in you, through you. Come up here, into my presence, under my anointing. Who has ears and a heart that's willing God calls us to himself this passage of scripture is like that passage of scripture that is in Exodus. God's getting ready to reveal himself. In fact, he's revealing himself. And he's calling. The word is going forth. The knocking has already started. Whoever hears my voice opens the door. I will come in. There's a passage of scripture that thrills my heart. John the Baptist prophesied. And he said, you know, there's one who's coming after me. Whose sandal I'm not worthy to even unlatch. When he comes, he'll baptize you. He says, you know, I, I'm baptizing you here in water unto repentance is a picture of something that is yet to come. And he said, the one who's coming, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. He said his winnowing fan is in his hand and he'll thoroughly thresh the wheat. Do you know what he's talking about? For everything, there's a purpose and a plan. Under the heavens, there's a time and a season for everything. There's a time to 
So, thank you. There's a time to plant, a time to water, and there's a time to reap. Harvest comes at the end of the planting season. The crops are harvested at the end of the season. And they are brought onto the threshing floor after the wheat's been harvested. And Jesus is on the threshing floor. John is speaking of that day and of that time. It's not for his day. It's for a time at the time of the end. He speaks directly into our day, into our time. Jesus calling whoever hears his voice, come. What did he tell those Laodiceans? Listen, you know, I know you're in love with silver and gold, but like he said in Haggai, listen, the gold is mine and the silver is mine. Your silver and gold doesn't mean a thing to me. You need to buy from me gold that is tried in the fire. He waits on the threshing floor in Malachi chapter 3. He says there's a refining process. And I'm calling. I'm calling those who are mine to come out from among all the rest and meet me on the threshing floor so that they can go through the refining process because the gold is mine, the silver is mine. They shall be mine, God says. On that day, when I make up my crown and my jewels, they shall be mine. He's our inheritance and is calling us to himself and we must meet him in that place. But he's a refiner's fire. Are you willing to go to that place? Are you willing to meet him in that place? You see, you'll never know the joy of a resurrected life until you learn how to die. And I'm sorry that this maybe isn't preached all, all around Christendom today, but it's the word. It's not easy grace. It's not a slippery slope into heaven. We are called to lay our lives down. And he's calling us to come into communion, intimacy, fellowship with him. But don't worry. Because you go in all tied up like the three Hebrew children. Do you remember that story? The book of Daniel? Devil had a plan and a purpose to take them out. Oh, let's just heat the furnace seven times hotter. Let's throw them in the fire. We'll get them. These radical ones who, you know, follow after this strange God will fix them. So they tied them up, bound them up, and threw them into the fire. But there was somebody in the midst of the fire who was waiting for them. And as they stood in the midst of the fire, the thing that bound them was burnt off. All of the ropes, all of the things that kept them, ensnared them, held them, bound them, was burnt up in the fire. What is God saying to this church? Dare to meet me there. I know you're not what you should be right now. I know there are things that have grabbed a hold of you and ensnared you and kept you. And maybe even they, held, they hold your dreams hostage. Maybe they are loved ones who need to be released. 
Meet me in the midst of the fire and that which holds you, binds you, consumes you, keeps you ensnared will be burnt off. Deliverance, freedom, healing, resurrection power comes in the midst of the fire of God. Listen, Moses said, listen, don't run away. What are you doing running away? How many of us run from the presence of God? Oh, afraid, afraid, God, God. He didn't come you here to destroy you. He didn't bring you this, to this place to, to, to wipe you out. He came to reveal himself to you so that you would know him, his power, his anointing, his glory, so that there'd be no question in your mind that he's God. And beside him, there's no other. And he'll do for you what you could never do for yourself. Even to this who is bound and ensnared because they can't make up their mind whether they have affection for the things of the earth. They love the temporal, the here, the now, the stuff. God says you're, you're double-minded and you can't stay that way because the double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And that brother, don't think that you'll receive anything from the Lord in that condition. So God says, come. I got to take this off. I got to release you from your bondage. I got to free you from anything that keeps you. Meet me on the threshing floor. I know that you're not what you should be. You still need my help. You still need my hand. You still need my power. You still might be my... Listen, I'm going to have a church that is without spot and without wrinkle. I didn't come for a prostitute. I didn't come for somebody who gives themselves to everything else. Would you marry somebody who said, well, you know what? I love you. And I'll give myself to you five days a week. But on Friday night and Saturday night, you know I got to hang with the... My old girlfriends that, you know, I just can't give them up. I, you know, I'll give you, all, give you myself, you know, Monday through Friday, I'm yours, baby. Would you marry somebody who said that? Just give me a day. Give me two days. Just give me, you know, my time once a month. Would you marry somebody like that? Of course not. Of course not. What makes you think God is coming back for a church that's in love with somebody else? Give themselves to everything else. Have all kinds of other lovers. All kinds of other affections. They're hot. They don't know whether they, they serve. They don't even know what to call them. They, they don't even have in, the, in their right minds. They don't even know what's holy and what's not anymore. They don't know. They follow after the world. Their traditions keep them from, from, from following after me. And they don't even know that their traditions are binding them and holding them and keeping them. So he said, you, you all are bound. You need to come. I got to do another work. I got to do a work in you on the threshing floor in the midst of my fire. And that's where Jesus is on the threshing floor calling Whoever, whoever will, come, meet me in the fire, into my very presence, where I longed you to be in the first place. You didn't go all the way. You started out on the journey, but you never made it into my presence. You never got close enough for me to actually do what I desired to do in you. You got afraid. See, your fear caused you to run away. 
But there was a fear that was in Moses that was not like the fear that was in you. And the fear that was in Moses caused Moses to draw near, even though he was terrified. Even though he shook. But it caused him to draw near. Because he knew, I, t- I talked with this guy before. <laughs> oh, yes, his, his power and majesty was displayed in Egypt. There's no doubt in your mind who you're dealing with. Oh, yes, he is terrifying. <laughs> but he didn't bring me here to destroy me. He brought me here to hear me. Brought me here to deliver me. Brought me here so that I would reflect his glory in the earth. That I would be to his praise, his honor. That in my life, he would be glorified. And in order for him to be glorified, there can't be anything that stands between him and I. So I have to willingly give myself and go into that place, into the presence of God, and say, yes, Lord. Here am I. You willingly gave yourself for me. Now I must willingly lay my and give myself for you so that you can do in me what I could never do for myself. I want to be to the praise and glory of your name. When others see me, I don't want them to see me. I want them to see you. I want to reflect you in every area of my life. To honor you, serve you, love you. Do you know the greatest days for the church lie just ahead? But you'll never experience them unless you go into the fire of God. Unless you make your way into the presence of God to be changed by the hand of God himself. Because what we're about to walk in, we've not walked this way before. It's not going to be like what we walked in before. There are challenges today that can only be met by the power of God. And we must be filled with his power and his anointing. The only thing that breaks the yoke is his anointing. No work of the flesh can save, can heal, can deliver. That's why we're sick in the church. That's why the presence of God is is like, oh, the spirit of God moved. We haven't seen that. You know, somebody who I haven't seen that in 20 years. How sad. 20 years you you walked in the wilderness and didn't... What did you think happened? God went on vacation for 20 years? What? And people say that. Places where I go. Wow, this altar, this this presence of God, this anointing. We haven't seen that. Shame, my God. This God. How far have we gone? We got to come back. God's calling us to come back. Who's going to answer the call? Who's going to believe God? Who's going to step into the plan and purpose of God? Listen, the culmination of all things is at hand. The glory of the last house. God's word is God's word. It will be greater than that of the former house. And in order for that to happen, we got to be ready. We've got to be willing to do what it takes by the unction of God. I've got to go into that place. I got to release myself from everything that holds me back. And I have got to willingly go where he calls me to go. And I got to go up into his presence, into the fire of God, where I know he can do 
heal me. He's going to deliver me. Those things that have bound, whether I realize that I'm bound or I'm not, doesn't make any difference. He can see things that I can't see. He knows things that I don't know. And if he's calling me there, then I must need to go there. But even at this age, even after we have walked with God, and you think you know him, and then he calls you back into that, say, come on, come on. Got to fix you because there's still some attitudes and things And let me burn them off. Let me penetrate a little deeper. Let me take you to a more intimate place than you've never been before so that I can really speak to you. So that there'll be no barrier between you and I. So that when I speak, you'll know, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I hear your voice. My ears are fine-tuned. The scales have fallen from my eyes. I can see. I love what the prophet said as he waited to hear from God. Habakkuk was his name. And he set himself upon the rampart and he said, I will watch and see what God will say. To me. He didn't say, I'm going to ready myself so I can hear what God says. He said, I'm going to watch and see what God will say. Do you know what he was saying? God, I don't want to just hear your word. I want to see what you see. I want to know what you know. I want to feel what you feel. I want to have your heart so that I know that I know that I know God. That was the heart of the prophet. That needs to be our heart. Our mindset. Whatever you will. Here am I. Here am I, Lord. Take me into that. Do whatever you will. Anything that binds me, keeps me, fetters me, chains me, all of my affections that don't line up with your word, some things hurt, but they're beneficial. Might have to say, I want to be what he would have me to be. For his glory. That's what it says on your door. For his glory. I was created for him. It's all about him. His glory. In my heart. In my life. Who willing to call? Who will be willing to go to that place. Don't hold back. Amen. Who agrees with the word of God this morning? Let me see your hands. Come on. Come on. <laughs> If you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father who's in heaven. <laughs> I believe your word. I sense your presence, Lord. When I came in here, I met the presence of God. I still feel the presence of God. I feel the anointing of God. I feel the presence of God, the voice of the Spirit calling to us. Who has ears this morning to hear? Don't matter how many years you've been in church.
Well, how long you think you've known him? Who doesn't need the presence of God? Anybody here who doesn't need? I just want to see anybody here, because I've never met a man who doesn't need the presence of God. Who doesn't need the presence of God? Who doesn't desire God's anointing? Who doesn't want to be filled with everything that he is and all that he has? Who doesn't want to walk in and fulfill the plan and purpose of God in the earth? Who doesn't want to give them Seth? I didn't see one hand. Therefore, you must be in agreement with God and his word. And if you are this morning, then I want you to join me here in this place. We're going to pray together as a body of believers. Of believers, because we're believers this morning, right? We take God at his word. We believe. And we're going to pray this morning that God would have his way in each and every one of our hearts. And we're going to give God permission to do whatever he will. Be excited this morning that God loves us enough to call us to himself. To give us himself. We seek hallelujah. Come on, church. Cry out to the Lord. Tell him this morning. Hear my Lord. At your feet. I've heard your word. I believe you, Lord God. I sense your presence calling me, drawing me to a deeper place, to a greater place. to intimacy, to communion, to fellowship, Lord, like I've never known before. Maybe I just have just a foretaste, but God, I want to go deeper. Deep calleth unto deep. Take me to the deeper place, says, oh God, in you, Lord, that I might know you. There's no Take the blinders off of our eyes. Let the veils fall from our faces. God, reveal yourself to us. So that we walk in your power, your anointing, God, your presence. So in love with you, God. We don't desire anybody else. Our hearts are fixed. Our mind is sure. We desire you, God. We desire you, God. Oh, Lord God, we desire you this morning, God. Lord God. Oh, down at your feet, Lord. At your feet, Jesus. We give ourselves at your feet. Oh, Lord. Laying it all down. I'm not holding anything back. The most high place. Jesus, in your presence, Lord.